This morning I want to start by just asking you to get a picture of God in your mind. Like, when you hear the word God, what, what kind of image floods into your mind? Like, what is he like? What do you envision? Is he good? Does he love you? Does he, does he, does he really care about you? Does he know what's happening with you? And then, like, think about this. Does he like you? Do you think he likes you? you think he enjoys you? Is he, is he distant or, or is he present? Like, are you on your own or is he, is he with you? Is he angry with you? Is he disappointed in you? Does he want, like, really good things for you? Can he be trusted? What, what is he like? That image is such a big deal. Like, when, when you hear the word God, what sort of feeling washes over you? Like, what do you believe deep down in your soul that he is really like? So not a, not a mindless, well, you know, I know, I know kind of what the Bible says answer. I mean, like, what do you actually believe? What is your experience deep down in your soul? Because we can all sing, Jesus loves me, this I know. But for that to have, that idea to have power, it has to move like from here to here. So today's message is about something super simple. It's about the idea that God is good, that, that he really loves you, that he can be trusted, that he can be known, and that he's worth knowing. And this morning, I want us to do something very unusual. If, if you're visiting with us, this is going to be very different. Um, but I want us to look at this from a very, like a certain angle that hit me a few years ago. When I, I had an experience and just like this whole message got birthed out of this experience. There's one biblical metaphor that just gets used over and over and over in the Bible. Like all through the Old and New Testaments is this image of God loving people like an adoring husband. Like an adoring husband that just loves his bride. We're told that God loved Israel this way. He provided for her. He protected her. He was was jealous for her. When she'd worship the gods of other nations, it it felt to him like she was cheating on him just a knife in the heart. It broke his heart. And even though that happened over and over, he kept taking her back over and over. He would forgive and restore and love her again and again and again. In the New Testament, the church is described as the bride of Christ. So like all through the Bible, the love of God is is described and explained to us in this way. He, he loves his bride like in spite of her imperfections. He sacrifices for her, her. He pursues her. And most of all, he never gives up on her. Like he stands by her to the end. It is a powerful and a very often used biblical metaphor. And this morning, what I want us to do is kind of delve into that. And I want to start by using imagery. And this is where the experience came from me. Um, by using imagery from a movie called The Notebook. Um, how many of you have seen The Notebook? I watched it last night with Brooklyn. <laughs> and I have to tell you, my wife being on a women's retreat, I was like, dang, baby, I just want to write you this like, massive love note, but I knew that would be totally distracting, so I didn't, didn't, didn't do that. <laughs> it is an incredible movie, one of my favorites of all time. And to me, it is a stunning portrayal of devotion. It is a man standing by his wife to the end, through the unimaginable through the unimaginable. But before we get to that, uh, I just want you to know, some of you are judging me right now, and I want you to know, (laughs) I am not a chick flick kind of guy, okay? I want to be super clear about that. Um, Mostly, I like like big testosterone dude movies, okay? Okay? (laughs) Okay, so just just to get it out, here are a few of my other favorites. There's Braveheart, okay? Oh my goodness, what a powerful display of, I don't know, virility. Every man dies. Not every man really lives. Or how about Gladiator? Come on. The courage, the leadership, like the battle scenes, just gets the man juices flowing. Or how about the epic story of masculine friendship? (laughs) Dumb and dumber, okay. 
So as you can see, I'm totally into dude movies. Um, but one of the most powerful films that I've ever seen is The Notebook. And um, I've heard people classify it as a chick flick. I cannot call it that. To me, it, it's, it's really about the depths of, of manhood. It's about standing by somebody, by a woman, for better or for worse, for life. And I think it's why so many guys that I've talked to or have talked to me about it were deeply moved by it. I mean, I, I, I've talked to so many guys that were wrecked by that, by that movie. I don't know any guys, I don't know any guys that were wrecked by Titanic. I mean, Titanic, it's just, it's, <laughs> and Titanic's about this like intense short fling, and then he dies. And guys don't like that because it's stupid. <laughs> okay? But the notebook, oh my goodness, like what an epic story of masculinity. And so let me give you kind of, for those of you that have seen it, I'm going to remind you, I'm going to give you the main plot of the movie. For those of you that haven't seen it, I'm about to totally ruin it for you. But it's about an elderly couple, and she has severe Alzheimer's. And at the beginning stages, while she can still function pretty well, she writes down the story of their life together so that he can read it to her to help her remember. So the movie really is about him reading to her from her notebook that she wrote. And as he's reading, then in the movie, the scenes just sort of flash back. And, and so you see their life lived out in their younger years. You see them meet, and you see them fall in love, and, and you see them go through all this hard stuff. But the main story just keeps pausing, and it keeps going back to him reading the story to her that she wrote. And every once in a while, hearing the story will just sort of trigger something in her, and for a moment, the Alzheimer's will lose its hold, and for a moment, she'll remember who she is, and she'll remember their life together. But most of the time, as far as she knows, he's just a strange man sitting with her, reading her an interesting story. Now, because her, her Alzheimer's is so advanced, she lives in a very high-care facility, and because he loves her so much, he just moves into the facility with her. He just refuses to go anywhere but be with her in, in, the, in her final days. And her care level is so high that he's not allowed to share a room with her, but he just gets his own little room in that same facility, and he spends every moment that he can with her reading the story of their lives, hoping that she'll remember, hoping that he can get a moment. And so um, we're going to kind of watch a scene and just kind of set this up. So, so, okay, here we go. Man, I'm telling you, it's, it's a beautiful image, I think. Just the unyielding devotion to this woman, to his promise, and an unwavering commitment to see this thing through. And the movie does a really brilliant job, in my opinion, of showing how painful all this actually is. She'll, she will come back and have a moment of, of clarity, like fleeting moments. She has flashes where, where uh, the story triggers her memory, and she, suddenly she knows who she is. And she remembers their life together. And, and he lives for those moments. I mean, he lives for those moments, but they don't, they don't last. They don't last. And so um, let's watch this second clip. You know, so despite how painful all of that is, he refuses to abandon his bride, not even for a day, and he's with her to the very end. Um, and the story ends, one night he sneaks into her room. It's against the rules, but the nurse looks the other way. And he tells her that he loves her, and he holds her hand. And then he lays down beside her, and he holds her. And that would be their last night. In the morning, the nurse comes in to check on her, and she sees him holding her. She leans in and feels their hands and they're both cold. And she knows that she has just um, seen something so rare and so beautiful. She has watched a man 
love his wife until death do us part. And so I'm telling you guys, that is no chick flick. <laughs> it, it's about strength and about courage and devotion. And so when, when the Bible uses groom or husband imagery to describe God, this is the kind of image that is supposed to, to flood into our minds. A relentless kind of love that just pursues us and pursues us and never gives up. It's the kind of love that no matter what happens, no matter how painful it might be for him, no matter how much it costs him, it's unshakable. Brennan Manning wrote what's become a classic book on the heart of God, and it's called The Ragamuffin Gospel. It's about the idea that that we're all beggars, okay, that's where the word ragamuffin comes from, that we're all, we're all beggars, and yet God loves us anyway. And he, he too uses the image in that book of marital love, and he shares a real life story as told by a, a surgeon named Richard Seltzer. And it's his experience, the surgeon's experience, with a married couple after a very difficult surgery a husband seeing his wife for the very first time after a tumor has been removed from her face and so here's the scene as it's described by the surgeon who was in the room in this moment he says i stand by the bed where a young woman lies her face post-operative her mouth twisted in palsy clownish a tiny twig of the facial nerve the one to the muscles of her mouth has been severed She will be thus from now on. The surgeon had followed with religious fervor the curve of her flesh, I promise you that. Nevertheless, to remove the tumor in her cheek, I had to cut the little nerve. Her husband is the room. He stands on the opposite side of the bed, and together they seem to dwell in the evening lamplight, isolated from me, private. Who are they, I ask myself. He in this wry mouth I have made, who gaze at and, and touch each other so generously, greedily. The young woman speaks. Will my mouth always be like this? She asks. Yes, I say, it will. It is because the nerve was cut. She nods and is silent. But the young man smiles. I like it, he says. It's kind of cute. All at once, I know who he is. I understand and I lower my gaze. One is not bold in an encounter with a God. Unmindful, he bends down to kiss her crooked mouth, and I am so close I can see how he twists his own lips to accommodate hers, to show her that their kiss still works. I think about the story of the Bible because it is a story about deeply flawed, disfigured people. It's a story about the way that God loves, the way that we somehow remain beautiful to him, the way he has to twist and contort to make things work. And you you think about all the contorting that happened in Christ. God himself taking on flesh and laying down his life for his bride. And in the church, we we talk about it so much that we can just kind of become numb to it. But you you think about the unwavering devotion of God. The the Bible is, is a story of a bride that just keeps losing her sense of reality. So the groom keeps coming, keeps telling the story, reminding her. She's a bride that is disfigured because of her own sin, but he tells her that she's beautiful again and again and again and again. And then he takes his own body and he lays it down, knowing that it's only through his suffering, through his sacrifice, that she can be made whole again. And this morning I want to do something really different for a few minutes. I'm going to stop trying to like explain that in my own lame words. And I just want to go straight to the ancient text. And so I'm going to spend several minutes just reading scripture to you. Um, I'm just going to read to you straight from the Bible. And if you're visiting with us again, I don't normally just stand up here and read the Bible for long stretches. But I want to read the story of Christ's sacrifice. And as you listen, I want you to reflect, okay, on the depth of his love for you. I want you to recognize that he did this for you. 
Not just like for people in general, not just for the world. He did this for you. And I just want you to sit back and let this sink in. Now, if, um, if you want, you can close your eyes. I invite you to do that, unless you're going to fall asleep, and then don't do that. <laughs> uh, but there's not going to be anything up on the screen. This is a lot of text, and so we're not going to try and put it all up on the screen. Um, I'm just going to read the story of the final hours for Jesus, and then I'm going to read a few passages about what it all means. But the whole point of this is I want you to take this in. I want you to think about what is he like? I want you to think about your relationship with him, the kind of relationship that he wants with you. And I want you to think about and, and, and even try to feel his heart for you. Okay, here we go. This is straight from Scripture. Okay, nothing, nothing but Scripture from here. While he was still speaking, a crowd came up. And the man who was called Judas, one of the twelve, was leading them. He approached Jesus to kiss him, but, but Jesus asked him, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? When Jesus' followers saw what was going to happen, they said, Lord, shall we strike with our swords? And one of them struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his right ear. Jesus answered, no more of this. And he touched the man's ear and healed him. Put your sword back in its place, Jesus said to him, for all who draw the sword will die by the sword. Do you think I cannot call on my father and he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels? But how then would the scriptures be fulfilled that say it must happen this way? Jesus said to the crowd, Am I leading a rebellion that you have come out with swords and clubs to capture me? Every day I sat in the temple courts teaching and you did not arrest me. But this has all taken place that the writings of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples deserted him and fled. Those who had arrested Jesus took him to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the teachers of the law and the elders had assembled. The high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and his teaching. I have spoken openly to the world, Jesus replied. I always taught in synagogues or at the temple where all the Jews come together. I said nothing in secret. Why question me? All those, those who heard me, surely they know what I said. When Jesus said this, one of the officials nearby slapped him in the face. Is this the way you answer the high priest, he demanded? If I said something wrong, Jesus replied, testify as to what is wrong. But if I spoke the truth, why did you strike me? Then the Jewish leaders took Jesus from Caiaphas to the place of the Roman governor. So Pilate came out to them and asked, what charges are you bringing against this man? If he were not a criminal, they replied, we would not have handed him over to you. Pilate said, take him yourselves and judge him by your own law. But we have no right to execute anyone, they objected. Pilate then went back inside the palace, summoned Jesus and asked him, are you the king of the Jews? Is that your own idea, Jesus asked, or did others talk to you about me? Am I a Jew? Pilate replied, your own people and chief priests handed you over to me. What is it you have done? Jesus said, My kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my, f my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But now my kingdom is from another place. You are a king then, said Pilate. Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. In fact, the reason I was born and came into the world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. What is truth, retorted Pilate. With this, he went out again to the Jews gathered there and said, I find no basis for a charge against him. But it is your custom for me to release to you one prisoner at the time of the Passover. Do you want me to release the king of the Jews? They shouted back, no, not him. Give us Barabbas. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. The soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head. They clothed him in a purple robe and went up to him again and again, saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and slapped him in the face. Once more, Pilate came out and said to the Jews gathered there, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no basis for a charge against him. When Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, Pilate said to them, Here is the man. As soon as the chief priests and their officials saw him, they shouted, Crucify! Crucify! But Pilate answered, You take him and crucify him. As for me, I find no basis for a charge against him. The Jewish leaders insisted, 
We have a law, and according to that law, he must die because he claimed to be the Son of God. When Pilate heard this, he was even more afraid. And he went back inside the palace. Where do you come from? He asked Jesus. But Jesus gave him no answer. Do you refuse to speak to me, Pilate said? Don't you realize I have power either to free you or to crucify you? Jesus answered, You would have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to set Jesus free, but the Jewish leaders kept shouting, If you let this man go, you are no friend of Caesar. Anyone who claims to be a king opposes Caesar. When Pilate heard this, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judge's seat at a place known as the stone. It was the day of preparation of the Passover. It was about noon. Here is your king, Pilate said to the Jews. But they shouted, take him away, take him away, crucify him. Shall I crucify your king, Pilate asked. We have no king but Caesar, the chief priest answered. Finally, Pilate handed him over to them to be crucified. Two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the Skull, they crucified him there, along with the criminals, one on his right, the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. The people stood watching, and and the rulers even sneered at him. They said, He saved others. Let him save himself if he is God's Messiah, the Chosen One. The soldiers also came up and mocked him. They offered him wine and vinegar and said, If you're the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was a written notice above him which read, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence? We are punished justly, for we're getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus answered him, Truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. It was now about noon, and darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon, for the sun stopped shining, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And when he had said this, he breathed his last. And I just want to read a couple of scriptures that tell us why all of this happened. And again, what I'm about to read is nothing but scripture. It's straight Bible. But it's pieced together from different places. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows, yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shears is silent, so he did not open his mouth. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. For there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all people. For God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit of life set me free from the law of sin and death. What then shall we say in response to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Okay, you can open your eyes if you had your eyes closed. Look up here. Again, what is God like? 
Well, he's, he's like a, a groom that will give everything for his bride. He can be trusted, he can be known, and he is worth knowing. What is God trying to do for you and, and for me? He's trying to give us everything. And we say, well, what does that mean, like everything? Well, he's trying to give us everything we need, everything we could ever want, everything we long for. Like somehow all of that is wrapped up in, in him. He's at the center of everything we need. Being in relationship with him, knowing him, makes us whole. There's something that happens in our soul when we, when we engage him. Jesus said we actually draw life from him, not just physical life, but also a deeper kind of life. And as long as we stay detached from him and separate from him, we feel an ache. We feel this emptiness. We feel incomplete. And so we try to find satisfaction apart from him. And we can try success. We can try to accomplish great things. We can try to earn the praises of the people around us. We can try pleasure, vacations, expensive food, extreme entertainment. We can go the route of comfort, like nice stuff, like really nice stuff. A nice house, a nice car, a boat, clothes. We can try to find it in romance or, or in sex. If we get desperate enough, if the ache is too painful, we can numb ourselves. Just numb ourselves with drugs or with alcohol or with TV we can forget, maybe, if we play hours and hours of, of video games or, or if we do whatever it is we like to do online. But we weren't made to find ultimate wholeness in those things. And so in the end, there's still an ache. There's still this emptiness. And sometimes, you know, sometimes people will say, okay, like, and maybe you're thinking this, yeah, okay. I've tried religion. And the truth is, it just, it just made everything worse. Like, I felt horrible about myself. I felt guilty all the time. I felt like I was never enough. I felt like I was chasing after something I could never catch. I felt uh, I, I could never be what I was supposed to be. I had to, had to give up all this other stuff in my life, stuff that I kind of liked, to tell you the truth. But in the, end, I was, in the end, I was more empty than ever. And so don't tell me that religion is the answer. And I'll just say, I'm not going to tell you that. Now, the truth is, religion will ruin your life. Uh, religion makes people afraid. Religion makes people insecure. And somehow, at the same time, and this is so weird. You watch this, it goes, so weird. They also become superior and judgmental. And they know that they aren't living up to like, their own standard, and so they feel really bad about it. And the way that they cope is to find people who are doing worse than them and judge them. It's empty, and, and it leads to death. Religion is about raising, somehow raising my level of performance. It's about avoiding sin and being good. Uh, it's about performing so that maybe God will love me. Let's go back to the scene of the disfigured woman in the hospital for a second. Her husband is standing by the bed looking at her, and he feels emotions that are almost unbearable. He's trying to figure out what to say. Can you imagine? He's trying to figure out what to say, how to love her, how to reassure her that she's beautiful to him. So he tells her, and then he kisses her. And he leans in and contorts his lips to fit hers. He shows her that their kiss will still work. But what if that scene had played out completely differently? What if he had kind of stood off in the distance, like cold, and said, you know, I'm so glad you didn't die from the tumor. I'm so glad you're alive. But, let's not kid ourselves, you're ugly now and I'm not really attracted to you anymore. But at least you can still get a bunch of stuff done for me, you know, because you're alive. You know, like, thank God for that. You can do my cooking and you can do my cleaning and you can raise my children. Thank God you're alive. Guys, is it me, or would that be just a little bit less inspiring? <laughs> and yet, like, this is the idea. Like, really, this is the idea that so many people have about God. He doesn't really like me. He doesn't think I'm beautiful. He doesn't enjoy me. 
He just wants me to do for him. He just wants me to perform for him. He wants me to be good. He's cold. He's distant. He's demanding. He's unsatisfied. Now, in all fairness, I mean, he does care how you live. That's true. Like, how you live matters to him. But he doesn't want you to live well so that he can love you. He wants you to live well because he already loves you. There's a way that leads to life, and there's a way to live that leads to death. And he wants life for you. He wants life for you. I mean, you just think about it. Jealousy. Jealousy leads to death. Contentment leads to life. Holding grudges leads to death. Forgiveness leads to life. Greed leads to death. Generosity leads to life. Selfishness leads to death. Love leads to life. What does God want for you? God wants you to have life. Being good was never really the main point. The point is to know him and and to engage with him and to allow him to make you whole. The invitation is to this life-giving relationship, not religion. And it's interesting. Sometimes people refer to the Bible like, what is the Bible? How do you sum up the Bible in a single phrase? And people will sum up the Bible in this way. They'll say, well, it's, it's just like, it's just, you know, the great instruction manual for life. <laughs> and, I, you know, okay, all right, I can see why it gets labeled, like, you know, I guess, and that's fine, like, I guess. But doesn't that reduce the Bible to just like a set of instructions to follow? And the thing is, it seems so ridiculously shallow to me. And so maybe a better way of thinking about Scripture is just that it's our story. It's the story of of God's love for us. And it reminds us who we are. It reminds us of our history with God and the way He feels about us. And we need it. Man, do we need it because it's like we all have Alzheimer's. God can be in the room with us. God can be right there in the room with us, and yet he's a total stranger. But when we hear the story, when we hear the story again and again and again, we start to to remember. We remember who we are. We, We remember who he is. We remember that we have history together. And so God asks us to come together in community and read the story. And he wants us to get together and talk about the story, grab coffee, hang out, visit in homes, wherever. He wants us to gather and talk about it all the time. Why? So that we can remember. So that he never becomes a stranger. You know, we don't, we don't go to church or go to Bible studies or, or hang out in, in Christian community because somehow the very act of that earns us brownie points with God. We go because with other people, we, we, we hear the story again. And we remember. And we do it with other people and we tell them the story because they need to hear. And we all need to be reminded like, oh yeah, oh yeah. Like God is good. Like he loves me. In spite of the messes in my life, he loves me. And he's right here. I'm not on my own. I never have been and I never will be. God wants us to remember that because somehow knowing that, knowing that not just here but here, it changes everything. 